Okay, what I'd like to do today is concentrate on some final aspects of the Paris notebooks and then focus on the German ideology. We'll turn to capital on Friday. But keep up with your reading according to the uh, syllabus and we'll, we'll try to get back on track in due time. Now, I think we've seen so far that the uh, entire discussion of the 1844 manuscripts, at least in the, in the sections that we are looking at, focuses on what Marx considers to be the ramifications of the central economic fact of his times and presumably our times as well, namely the relationship between what could be considered the worker and the employer or the worker and the agent of capital. Not too much is said about the nature of capital. The focus rather concerns uh, what is happening and what might be called in relation to the subsequent work of Marx, the immediate labor process that transpires um, on the basis of the interaction of worker and owner of capital. We've seen that Marx discusses these relationships in terms of three categories, objectification, estrangement, and alienation. And he tends to treat what happens in this relationship as being definitive of the entire situation of not just the worker, but one could say of humanity in the modern age. And to some degree, a, a clue as to why he makes that kind of extreme inflation between the relationships that he sees transpiring in the relation of the worker to uh, the production process and uh, the force that presides over the production process, to the exclusion of any other domains of human activity or human life or human concern. This is all tied to how he conceives of uh, this relation as being one in which the laborer is treated as a commodity. Labor is what is taken ownership by the agency that presides over the production process as owner of capital. Now, if that's the case, one could say we're talking literally and perhaps quite incoherently about a situation of wage slavery, where there can be no other domain left to the individual who is a commodity uh, owned by the owner of capital. And to some degree, we see this reflected in the nature of the remedy that Marx points to. Because the remedy is going to have nothing determinate to say about any other spheres of activity. Um, you may remember that this, all the talk of the species being of the individual was defined in a rather technical way with regard to how the human animal has a kind of unlimited relationship to nature in that unlike other animals who, in virtue of their species being, have very fixed spheres within which their metabolism proceeds. The human animal can relate to anything in nature and is able to abstract from any particular situation and can deal with nature in its universality as an object of human activity. Now here when Marx is characterizing the universality of species being in these terms, in these, in these terms of a kind of universal mastery, note it's being discussed in terms of a purely monological relationship. That is a relationship of the individual subject to nature. The species being is not being construed in any fashion in terms of relationships between agents. Think by contrast of how someone like Aristotle will construe what is really distinctive of the human animal as having something to do with political life which involves a very distinctive type of interaction, an interaction characterized by ends that are universal in character. Yeah. 
So the species being is um, the individual human's ability to interact with nature? Or well, what, but it's distinctive about it, and that's how he's describing it. It's having yeah. this kind of universal scope, and for that reason, because it's thought of in terms of what could be considered how we work upon objects, not how we interact with other subjects, but how we work upon objects. For this reason, when we are alienated to our productive activity in the production process with capital, we are alienated and estranged from our species being. Because now, it, a yeah. Oh, sorry. Because no. it limits. Uh, because you know, being alienated to one type of labor limits the well, species well, no, being of. Yeah. Well, no matter what, no matter what kind of activity goes on in the production process, and Marx is not here speaking at any length about the nature of commodity production and the way in which it can take on completely, shall we say, artificial scope, producing things that have never existed before. For example, that have nothing to do with with our survival needs, but our need for an iPod or anything else we might imagine. Uh, the point is that uh, insofar as the laboring activity is something the worker does not own, but it's owned by another agency, in being a stranger, alienated from that productive activity, whatever it may be, we are being estranged from our species being, insofar as the species being is being characterized in these terms. Now, as a result, when we speak about overcoming the estrangement, the alienation, that has to do with this basic fact of capital-labor relationship, the remedy is going to be construed in a way where nothing determinate is said, for example, about how there might be family relations and how they ought to be structured in order to be legitimate, nor is there any real talk about distinctly political institutions in any determinate fashion. Rather, the focus has to do with how what might be considered production is organized and presided over. And one might say, well, either these other spheres are eliminated or they simply drop out of our scope of interest as matters having nothing to do with what counts in the human life or the life of any rational agents. Now, Marx has not too much to say about the remedy. He describes it in some respects under two headings. One will have to be one one will be the the term communism. At times, you'll also speak of socialism. Uh, and in uh, <coughs> the Paris notebooks, he has a section uh, on page 78 following where he distinguishes three forms of, of communism. I think, as, as you may have seen yourself, although he distinguishes three forms of communism, it's hard to get a sense of how this, what the second form is, is supposed to be in distinction from either the first or the third. And exactly what the third is is something that uh, remains. Well, uh, somewhat difficult to lay a handle on. The first form of communism that's identified uh, may be uh, fleshed out sufficiently to give you an idea of why the Paris manuscripts, or also called the 1844 manuscripts, were not permitted to be published during the reign of uh, the Soviet Union. I have no idea whether they'd been published in China, let alone North Korea or Cuba in more recent times. But if you look at the first characterization of communism, Marx speaks of it as being just, merely, a universalization and fulfillment of private property. And he speaks of this as being a crude communism that he identifies with envy. He identifies it with envy as indeed the fulfillment of envy. He speaks of it as a leveling down according to an imagined minimum. It has a fixed and restricted standard. 
and it involves a kind of return to an unnatural simplicity of the poor man, bereft of needs, who has not even achieved private property, let alone gotten beyond it. Well, what are we talking about here? What are we talking about? Well, we're talking about a former community, he tells us on page 79, that is only a community of labor and of a quality of wages paid by the communal capital. We have the community as universal capitalists. And both sides, he tells us, are raised to an imaginary universality. That is, labor is the defined place of everyone. Capital is, in a sense, the recognized universality and power of the community. Well, what is he talking about? How is this realized? In a certain respect, one could say that this involves the achievement of, well, you could say the realization of something that Marx has pointed to earlier, both in uh, some indications in the 1840 more manuscripts and in the uh, um, German ideology, where he's spoken of the universality I'm sorry, we've spoken of the proletariat as having something universal in character. You may remember the universal character of the proletariat was in the sense that it didn't have a, a really particular interest of its own. Where it had something of its own to fight for over against the interests of other, uh, other groupings in, in, well, let's just call it society in general. Uh, it didn't because of what feature that was ascribed to the proletariat. What allowed it to figure as a universal class, or a class that had a kind of universality? That would allow it also to be a kind of revolutionary subject. It was not concerned in simply increasing its share against the shares of other groups with whom it stands in a, a kind of adversarial relationship, but to be something that, uh, in a sense, stands over and against the entirety of the status quo and thereby has nothing to lose but his own chains. What is it that is ascribed to the proletariat? It's tied to its supposed universality. Well, it's, it's alleged to be propertyless. Propertyless. Well, I mean, a slave has no property. A slave is an object of property. A worker who is a commodity has no property, but is owned by someone else. Well, we're going to want to ask ourselves whether this can possibly be an adequate way of thinking about a class in general, uh, a class in distinction from other types of groupings, a class specific to civil society. But here we're talking about a situation where indeed one could say the proletariat as a class has become universal. That is, we have a society in which a plurality of classes has been eliminated. How has it been eliminated? How do we achieve a classless society? Here. Superseding of private property? What? The superseding of private property. Well, when you say superseding of a private property, again, that can be, um, I mean, Marx will speak in those terms, of course. But ultimately, what type of property is at stake here? Means of production. Exactly. Ownership of the means of production. Because after all, if one is to say that the individuals in society, call them workers or not, are not to be slaves, they have to, in some respect, be acknowledged to own their own body. And not to have a body susceptible of appropriation by others. Moreover, if they're going to have anything to consume, let alone the clothes on their back, This is their property, in a sense, if it's not to be something that anyone else can rip off them and freely dispose over. So in a sense, this talk about being devoid of property doesn't make sense unless one understands that what might alone plausibly be uh, at stake here is that we're talking about workers who do not own the means of production, either the object they work upon, let alone the instruments with which they work upon it. Of course, Marx now adds that they don't own their labor either. They give it up, and in doing so, become a commodity. 
Well, here one can speak of a classless society being established to the extent that everyone operates as a, a laborer. How can everyone, everyone without exception, be a worker? And in a sense, be in the exact same situation as before, except now it applies to everyone? How? Well, who now is the owner of capital? Or the owner of the means of production? Community. The community. Call it the state. How is that achieved? Well, you could call it nationalization of the means of production. Or another way of putting it, by eliminating private ownership of the means of production, everyone becomes a wage laborer. Everyone becomes a wage laborer. Everyone, in other, in other words, falls prey to this same kind of relationship. And moreover, we now have, as part and parcel of it, you could say the ideology of this nationalization of all, all means of production, or this elimination of class differences by making the proletariat the one and only class, making everyone, in other words, a wage laborer, is a notion that this is going to achieve inequality, inequality that will reduce any disparities in the wages. Not, of course, that nationalization has anything to do with that, necessarily. You can have state ownership as a means of production and have any degree of disparity in wages, as, of course, you have had in the so-called historical socialist or communist regimes, where there's always been a tremendous degree of, well, uh, difference in the levels of ownership of uh, different workers and, of course, tremendous disparities and privileges, uh, given the nature of one-party rule and the like. But here, in any event, the notion is that we have here envy uh, triumphing. Because here, the nationalization of, of commerce has taken place for the sake of putting everyone on the same level, making everyone a worker to begin with, putting everyone in the same functional role, in the same relationship, you could say, of alienation and estrangement and everyone also receiving this artificial level of poverty. Everyone becomes equally impoverished under this situation. And everyone finds themselves submitting to the same kind of alienation and estrangement. You might ask yourself, well, OK, the community presides over everything, but you are still, in a sense, receiving a wage. Um, there are employees who are concerned with running affairs in the enterprises. Um, but everything could be said to be owned by uh, the community. Well, note that that ownership of the community does not alter the fundamental character of the relationship of individuals to their activity. At least Marx is willing to recognize that it doesn't. Now, he points to a second form of, of uh, communism. And here he says it can either have political it can either have a political nature, it could be democratic or despotic, or it could involve the abolition of the state. In either case, it remains incomplete. It remains afflicted with private property, with man's estrangement, which holds whether one, whether there is a state or there is no state. Um, but he says this communism already knows itself to be man's reintegration or return to himself, the superseding of human self-estrangement, but it is not yet grasped the positive nature of private property or understood the human nature of need and remains infected by private property. Now the question is, what, what is he here referring to that's in any way distinct from the first form of, of, of communism? What could he be referring to? I mean, there's very little to go on. But I'll point to other arrangements that you might consider and ask yourself whether they would make any difference. In other words, one can speak on the one hand of different ways of eliminating the relationship between privately owned means of production and the situation of those who work. And one can think of this being done on a, a national level, in a centralized way, right? Which seems to presume that we are speaking about a kind of, well, universal community. On the other hand, you could think of arrangements that have a more particular scope, 
you could think of things arranged in a similar way in terms of independent communes, right? We have smaller decentralized groupings, which communally uh, own the means of production and then employ their members. Of course, this raises issues in addition regarding how the different communes are to interact with one another and how one is to think about that as well as what kind of inequalities could lay hold between the different kinds of communes given their different situation and so forth. But again, it's very unclear what this amounts to. And the same could be said about the third, uh, the third notion of communism, which is here spoken of as the full positive superseding of private property, of human self-estrangement. Here you have what Marx calls the actual appropriation of the human essence by and for man. Now, how does that occur? How do we hear of the actual appropriation? You have the elimination of private ownership of the means of production through nationalization. But that did not eliminate the situation of alienation and estrangement. It made everyone a worker. It made everyone share the same kind of artificial level of restricted poverty and so forth. Well, here, supposedly, we have, Marx says, the completing conscious return of man to himself as a social, i.e. human being. This is accomplished, he says, with the entire wealth of the previous development. It depends upon all of that. And here now, he says, we have a fulfilled humanism that equals naturalism. We have the general resolution of the conflict of man in nature and of man with man. All these types of alienations that are alleged to occur in terms of the capital labor relation are, are, are eliminated. Now they are resolved. Now exactly what is it that has been achieved? Well, he tells us that it's going to involve, in a sense, man's return away from religion, family, state, etc., to his human social existence. Note, the social existence is counterposed to religion, family, state, etc. Well, the question is, what is this social existence then? It doesn't involve any household institutions. It doesn't involve any political institutions. It doesn't involve any religion. It doesn't involve any of the etc. It just involves this social existence. Now, the question is, what is this social existence? It's something in which he then goes on to say man's activity and enjoyment in their content and their mode of existence are social activity and social enjoyment. Only in social man do, does a natural and human existence coincide. Well, what does this mean? Now, you might think that this would involve a situation where one's activity, productive activity, and one's consuming would in some respect be something that one does not engage in merely individually, but engages in such a way that One's activity is tied to the activity of everyone else. One's consumption is tied to the activity of everyone else. And you might ask, well, what would that involve? And how would it operate as a social relationship in distinction from a political relationship? I mean, for example, you could think of it to some degree in a kind of political administrative terms where everyone co-determines what productive activities are going to engage in and how the product will be uh, distributed. Everyone could have an equal say, right? One could, of course, apply this to everything. Who will be your spouse? What decisions will be made regarding children, child rearing? What kind of entertainments will be produced? What kind of artworks will be produced, etc. Everything could be subject to the co-determination of everyone. Note that in doing that, one might have a certain kind of, one could say, self-determination, but one would also forfeit the kind of freedom one has within other kinds of frameworks, such as one's freedom to join with someone else in a household and co-determine its affairs, or one's freedom to independently choose one's career or what activity one wants to pursue, or to choose what you want to consume. 
individually, let alone to choose, well, what uh, political program you want to pursue, what kind of party you want to organize, and so forth and so on. But it's not clear. Marx doesn't say whether he's talking about that kind of, in a sense, reduction of all types of self-determination to what might be thought of as a universal, collective, almost a political determination, which directly takes hold of all other spheres. Where there are no independent spheres, such as a household sphere or a social sphere, which is not directly subject to collective administration. But then we might ask, well, what, what else might this involve? How, what, how can one consider this, um, this social situation? And there's a remark towards the very end of, of our selection in the 1844 manuscripts. Remarks to some degree seems to be asking us to think about the situation. He says, you know, assume that we had produced as men and this is on page 95 of our selection. Then if we really produced as men, not as alienated, estranged individuals, but as individuals at one with their species being, then each of us would have doubly affirmed him or herself and the other. And he says the following, I would have in my production objectified my individuality and its particular characteristics and thus also enjoyed during the activity an individual expression of life. And in contemplating the object, had the individual joy of knowing my personality to be an objective, sensibly perceptible, and thus a power uh, raised beyond all doubt. But then, in addition to that, not only would I, in a sense, be aware of myself in my activity, but in your enjoyment of, or your use of my product, I would immediately have had the enjoyment as well as a consciousness of having in my labor satisfied a human need, and thus of having objectified the human essence, and so of having provided an object that meets the need of an other human being. I would have, in other words, produced something that is for the consumption of another. I would know that I, in a sense, am engaged in an activity that is going to be connected intrinsically to the satisfaction of the needs of others from that respect. In in a sense, enjoying my own need through my activity, I would be gaining a satisfaction that is tied to the satisfaction of others. Um, I would, he says, in my individual life expression, have directly provided yourself your life expression, and thus in my individual activity, have directly affirmed and objectified my true being, my human, my communal being. This relationship would be reciprocal. That's interesting to ask yourself, what exactly does this Involve. It almost seems to give us an account of nothing other than commodity relations themselves. Or the relationships one is in in civil society where everyone is in a situation where in order to satisfy their own needs, they must engage in an activity that will furnish what others need. And in that regard, in affirming my own livelihood, I'm equally facilitating the livelihood of others. And what I'm producing is being produced not for any individual need, but for, one could say, need in general, or market need in general. Well, we we'll want to think about what, what, what does this actually involve? What is the nature of a society in which individuals, in a way, in pursuing their individual particular activities and particular satisfactions are at the very same time upholding those of others and in so doing achieving something of universal significance. We want to see what is that? Is it communism? as something that overcomes private property and commodity relations, or is it something that actually is exhibited in commodity relations themselves? Even if commodity relations may impose certain barriers to aspects of the exercise of this kind of reciprocal uh, self-affirmation. I want us to think about these questions as we turn to the, on the Jewish question of Marx, 
where the focus of Marx's attention is no longer on the relationship of labor and capital, but more upon two sets of relationships. One is a relationship between the state and civil society, and the other is a relationship between religion and both the state and civil society. Uh, before we go on, are there any questions regarding the earlier discussion of 1844 manuscripts right now? Okay, well, let's turn now to the, on the Jewish question. Uh, I think it's one of Marx's most interesting writings. Uh, you know, he begins by uh, discussing the figure whose account he's actually attacking and presenting an alternative view to. Namely, he's in a sense almost providing a review of Bruno Bauer's work, The Jewish Question, in which Bauer, who Marx also discusses in the German ideology, um, is considering the situation of the Jews in Europe of his day where the body politic has not disassociated itself from religion. The body politic is, is, has an official religion attached to it, namely Christianity. You have a Christian state. And you have Jews in the Christian state. And Jews, on the one hand, are at a political disadvantage by not being Christians. On the other hand, their very own religion, on Bauer's account, does not allow them to integrate themselves in political life. Because in viewing themselves as a chosen people subject to their own covenant with God and being subject to their own divine laws and so forth, they have a, a particular existence that is at odds with what it means to be a citizen. So Bauer suggests, in a sense, for Jews to emancipate themselves requires political emancipation. Political emancipation meaning the emancipation of the state from religion, which is taken by Bauer in a very literal sense. That is, when we set up a purely secular state based upon, you could say, the separation of uh, religion and state, this, in effect, is going to also overcome religion in general. Now, Marx points out, first of all, that this is not the case. And if you look, in particular, at North America, where you have perhaps the most thorough political emancipation in the sense of the achievement of a separation between religion and state in none other than the United States, you have, as the Tocqueville remarked, you know, this incredible flourishing of religion. That is, the privatization of religion, the fact that the state has separated itself from religion, and not allowed any public affairs to be uh, privileged according to the religious affiliation of the participants in those public affairs, has not led to the elimination of religion. Religion is flourishing. It's flourishing in this cornucopia of different religious groupings, none of which has any political privilege. But Marx points out that, in a sense, the fact that political emancipation, in the sense of emancipation from religion, has not eliminated religion, has a sort of double bearing on the, on the so-called Jewish question, because it indicates that, in a sense, political emancipation does not free the Jews from what is singular about the religion, nor does it free anyone from religion. And that as long as there is religion, that's indicative of some problem, some limitation to political emancipation. Now, you might ask, well, why should the fact that there is still religion be a mark against political emancipation? Well, what, what is Marx's basic claim that he seems here to be recapturing regarding the reality of religion? These are the well, what might be considered emancipation? What is the alleged significance of religion for Marx? Which to some degree he shares with Feuerbach and the other young Hegelians who he is politicizing against. What is it? Should be limited to the private sphere. Well, that's not good enough. The very fact that there is religion indicates something wanting. It indicates the presence of what? It's a form of alienation. 
Because what is one doing in religion that involves alienation and self-estrangement? What's that? Excluding non members. Even if one has a religion like Christianity, <coughs> which is external. open to all and proselytizes. Yeah. Putting things external to ourselves. Putting what? Putting uh, situations external to ourselves. And doing what with regard to what is external to ourselves in religion? God. Fundamentally, God, the divine, right? A transcendent being. To whom, nevertheless, we are going to relate because it's only in our relation to God that we're going to find our true essence. Right? So we're putting our true essence outside of ourselves. We're estranging ourselves from ourselves. And this, of course, is something that has a secular realization, Marx has been telling us in the 1844 manuscripts, in that fundamental fact, that economic fact of the modern situation, namely capital labor relationship. But now here, Marx has a different focus. Here he wants to consider the limits of political emancipation itself, and the way in which political emancipation has to be understood as different from human emancipation. That somehow political emancipation, which is, as American experience shows, above all, is compatible with the flourishing of religion. Political emancipation is not to be identified with so-called human emancipation. Because it, in a sense, is going to involve something that is reflected in religion. It's going to involve a certain kind of illusion or false idealism of, of sorts. And we want to understand what that um, amounts to and how we can understand that. Now, Marx is going to point to how political emancipation involves the emergence of a political community that he says acts as a mediator. It acts as a mediator, just in the way in which religion involves something that acts as a mediator to a true essence that is in some respect estranged or removed from ourselves. Now, the question is, what is this uh, way in which the state acts as a mediator, what is it that is restrictive about political emancipation? And in what respect, as Marx puts it, can one be a free citizen of a free state without at the same time being a free human being? Well, the state is allegedly the mediator between man and human freedom. How is it? Well. On the one hand, he points out, one could regard the emergence of political emancipation and the free state that has come to be by way of the French Revolution, the American Revolution, for example, as being something that could be said to annul private property in certain respects. Because what it does is it separates the political domain from any direct relationship to any particular private ownership. No one owns the state in which, in feudal times, in certain respects, political privileges could be said to be owned or part of, in a sense, the property and privilege of individuals. Now here, the state, as Marx puts it, uh, this is on page 35, dissolves distinctions of birth, of social rank, of education, and of occupation, declaring all of them to be non-political distinctions. None of these distinctions give you any political privileges. No political functions are immediately tied to any of these factors. These factors instead are divorced or demarcated from the political domain in which individuals interact with one another as citizens whose roles as citizens are not defined by these other relationships. Nonetheless, the state presupposes these distinctions, and, and Marx suggests that in the state, where individuals relate to one another simply as citizens, not as individuals with different types of roles based on what might be considered social relationships or relations of family to birth, rank, gender, anything else. Here, in the political domain, one enjoys a kind of 
species be? A kind of universality. We are all citizens of this universal institution that presides over all the political spheres of non-political life. Yet Marx points out that this universality that has depends upon its relationship to these non-universal spheres, these other spheres of life. And in a sense, this universal species life that individuals enjoy as citizens is something that they engage in in opposition to their life in what he characterizes as the material life in which all of these particular distinctions play themselves out. So as a result, when we have political emancipation, we're talking about a doubling, where individuals operate as citizens in distinction from the life they lead in civil society, the domain into which all of these other particular engagements have been reduced. And in being reduced to the sphere of civil society, they have become private. They're not public. They're not connected to political life. They have become privatized. And Marx claims that, well, uh, on the one hand, this universal life that one leads as a citizen has something that he characterizes as being illusory. Its universality is somehow illusory, just as Christianity, for example, will treat everyone as equal before God in the afterlife, as opposed to their very different situations in the actual life. Well, so too, <coughs> this universal political equality that citoyens or citizens enjoying the political sphere is illusory with respect to the real differences that play within the domain of civil society, the material engagements of individuals. Secondly, not only is the universality something illusory, the species being of individuals operating allegedly as emancipated universal political agents, enjoying equal political rights, well, there's also a conflict between what is going on in the role of domain of politics and what happens in civil society. In fact, the alleged universality of the political sphere is actually illusory in that it is at odds with civil society. And the political domain, in effect, serves as an instrument for interests in, in civil society, particular interests. There is a conflict at, at, at stake here. So on the one hand, we have a kind of dualism, reflecting the kind of dualism that religion provides, where individuals have a species life as citizens and an individual life in civil society. Civil society, Marx wants to suggest, is their true life. Now, you might ask, well, how is it true life? Marx is not denying that there is, there are political institutions where individuals act as citizens. But somehow, the universality of political life is not truly independent and autonomous, but in some respect is at odds, and also in some respect subservient a means with what is going on in civil society. Now, to get a, a sense of this, we also have to recognize how civil society is here being construed. Because Marx is going to construe civil society in ways that fit very much what might be considered the view of traditional social contract theory which ends up having a very particular view of the body politic, which will view the body politic as being something instrumental, as being something simply for the sake of protecting and upholding and serving the interests of individuals as private individuals, as individual owners of property. Now, we get a sense of this when Marx speaks of human rights. Um, in connection with uh, the relationship of political to human emancipation. There are so-called human rights. Part of them are political rights, uh, which you can only exercise in community with others. We're talking about your rights to participate in self-government, right? 
You can't exercise your rights of self-government without interacting with others within constitutional political institutions. But on the other hand, you have other rights that are different from those of political community. And these are the ones that really, properly speaking, can be thought of as human rights. And they can be thought of human rights because here we're dealing with not engagements in political freedom, not the rights of citizens, but the rights that one exercises as a private individual. The rights of freedom of conscience, the right to exercise the religious cult of one's choice, the privilege of belief, and of course, the right to dispose of one's property and to engage in those kind of market activities that one sees fit. These are the rights of civil society, and these rights can be considered the rights of man or humanity or human rights proper because when Marx looks at civil society here and in other junctures, he refers to it as, in a sense, a framework within which individuals operate as what he calls egoistic man, the man who is separated from other men and from community. He identifies this with a famous uh, dictum that Thomas Hobbes uses to describe the state of nature. Note, the state of nature, not a determinate social association, let alone an historic, a specific historical structure, but what is, what is, how does Hobbes describe the, the state of nature? That's a state of war all against all. Where individuals, in a sense, have a liberty, namely a choosing will, which, precisely because it is arbitrary, can choose whatever it pleases, finds the will of others to be a restriction upon its autonomy, a threat to its autonomy, not something that is part of the realization of one's freedom. Whereas, for example, in the political domain, quite obviously, you can't exercise your political freedom unless others are also engaged in exercising their political freedom. Why? Does them uh, engage in activities that take away your freedom? Well, in a sense, if they exercise their political rights, they can't do anything that will take away your, freedom, your political freedom. But if they don't exercise any political activities whatsoever, there's no body politic to engage in self-government. So the different engagements in the exercise of political rights are conditions for the realization of that right on the part of everyone. But if you think in terms of the state of nature, where one thinks of a freedom that has no connection to the freedom of others, but is simply the individual arbitrary choice of individuals, the will of others is always a restriction upon one's choice, a potential restriction. Marx identifies this with civil society. It's, it's a society, it's hardly society, it's a war of all against all. It's a literally private, a domain of private individuals who have interests and ends and, in a sense, domains that have no inherent connection to one another. Yes? So, so civil society is just human rights as opposed to political rights, or it's the interaction? Well, it becomes a place that one can speak of as being the domain of human rights, because here the individual, on Marx's account, operates simply as the isolated individual. Not the individual in a particular type of institution or a particular type of cultural relationship or historical relationship, but the individual as such, man as such. So for that reason, the rights of civil society can be understood as human rights because they seem to pretend to the individual in isolation from other individuals. And if you, if you follow out the logic of this view, which is that of social contract theory, precisely because we are impediments to one another's natural liberty, <coughs> because my choices may go against your choices, we need a public institution to protect us from one another, to provide us with security, protection, and upholding what is ours, what is mine, from the arbitrariness of others. That public authority is, as Marx notes, what Hegel calls a police state, not the state proper, but a police state. A state that is an instrument. It's instrumental. It's for the sake of the 
private liberty of individuals. <clears throat> it's subordinate. It really is not something standing above. It's rather something serving at the disposal of this domain of interaction. So in a sense, the citizen, as Marx puts it, uh, is really declared the servant of egoistic man. And in that regard, as long as one has individuals um, in this situation, we find ourselves really, in a sense, at the beck and call of this material, egoistic state of affairs, where we are, in a sense, alienated from one another, where we operate as particular. Our species being stands above this in an illusory manner. Well, in a certain sense, it might appear that the state has some, some inherent value of its own because, as Marx points out, the emergence of the state as something distinct from these groupings is something that comes to be in a political revolution that is at the same time a social revolution, a revolution that establishes civil society by overcoming feudal society. This is something seen really more emphatically in a way in the French Revolution, although the institutions of political freedom end up being overturned by Napoleon and previous rest, uh, subsequent restorations. But you have an emergence of a sphere of citizens by means of the elimination of the feudal relationships which had estate groupings determining how one related to both power and wealth at one and the same time by overturning them and freeing the political domain so that everyone can have an equal footing in it one equally establishes a civil society where we face one another, not in terms of birthright, not in terms of feudal distinctions, but in, as individuals who have choosing wills and needs and confront one another on that basis. Now, we want to take into account uh, how Marx judges his situation, and we'll do that when we reconvene and look at what he thinks is the remedy based upon the problem that he suspects is here, and then turn to Marx's final work, which he never completes, Capital, and see what happens there in his understanding of economic workings of civil society, whether it conforms to this or sheds new light yeah. on, on our predicament. <laughs>